Good afternoon, friends and members of the Trinity Lutheran Church family. It's me, Pastor Mike Cherney, coming at you from my office at church. And with our next installment of our online study of 1 Corinthians, where we are seeing that the gospel creates community. Really, last time our objective was to just get a taste of the way that the gospel creates community. And last time we discussed the topics of acceptance and tolerance, how it's natural for us to want to be accepted and tolerated, but that the gospel creates a new kind of acceptance and a new kind of tolerance. We talked about a confession of faith, that the use of the creeds in the, in the church is to confess what true Christian faith is. And that the theology underneath those confessions of faith, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and the Athanasian Creed, if you ever read that one, are very much biblical. They're in, in the Bible. There they were in the first couple verses of 1 Corinthians. And so you can see that, that we're not making this stuff up, the stuff that we confess in, in uh, Christian church services. Last time we also talked about God's grace for sinners. And here is where we really are starting to get into the community aspect of our study. Because when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians, remember he didn't have a whole lot to thank them for at the beginning. Usually in Paul's letters, his epistles, he opens up with thanksgiving. He thanks his audience for something. But in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians, what he thanks them for is he thanks them for God's grace because they are examples of God's grace. There were a lot of things that they were doing wrong. There were a lot of things that, a lot of ways that they were demonstrating that they were not living as a Christian community. But Paul is thankful because he can see God's grace at work among them. God's grace is his undeserved love, his forgiveness that he shares with people like you and me, people who don't deserve to be loved by God. But that's what grace is. God loves us. He forgives us. And he purifies us through the washing of rebirth and renewal. He purifies us through the blood of his son and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. But today we're really going to dig in that word gospel. We're saying that the gospel creates community. But let's see what that gospel precisely is. So to kick things off with the people around you or with somebody, answer this question, discuss with, this, discuss with somebody this question. Why does our church exist? And here I'd encourage you to give everyone a chance to speak. Let, even if somebody has to, wants to review or repeat what somebody has already said, uh, all answers are fair game and open for discussion. And throughout this video, I'd encourage you to pause. Go ahead and pause me. <laughs> I know, I know that ability would be handy in real life sometimes, but go ahead and pause me and and have the discussion uh, as these questions come up. So, why does our church exist? Next thing, pop quiz. Who in your group can explain the two doctrines of scripture, law and gospel? What are they? What are the differences? And why are they both necessary? For this one, I'll give you a little pastor answer and help out a little bit. The two doctrines of scripture, as we say in the Lutheran church, are law and gospel. And this is the way that we, that we understand the way scripture does its thing, because the law is meant to cut us, cut our heart. The, the law is meant to show us our sin, SOS, we say sometimes in, in catechism class. The law shows us our sin so that we know how desperately we need to be saved. We need to know that we can't do it on our own. We need to know that we're lost on our own. And that prepares us, hearing the law, prepares us to hear the gospel. Now, the SOS for the gospel is that the gospel shows us our Savior. We're prepared by the law and seeing that we're sinful and that we can't save ourselves so that we can hear from the gospel where our salvation comes from. It comes from the Lord, from the maker of heaven and earth. It comes from the sacrifice that Jesus has done for us on the cross, which we just celebrated on Good Friday and his victory, we continue to celebrate now that we're in the season of Easter. Real quick, before we get into the verses for today, if you have time, uh, we since we are kind of skipping around in this study, last time we went through verse by verse of the opening verses of 
1 Corinthians. I encourage you to go back to our sermon series that we did on the opening verses, the opening chapters of 1 Corinthians. Go ahead and click that link. I'll include the, the link to the slides presentation so you can follow that link to a, a reading copy of of the first sermon in that series. And then go ahead and search out our podcast where you can find the rest of those sermons in our First Corinthians series. And continuing up to today, uh, all of our sermons are being uploaded on the podcast. So huge shout out to Micah Ray. He's the one who's putting them on there. Uh, really appreciate his volunteerism and his, and his work. You can also search us out on Apple Podcasts if you search Trinity uh, Lutheran Church El Paso or also on Spotify. I know our podcasts are there too. And I think we're on Google, but you might have to double check that one. So now let's get into some scripture. We talked about law and gospel. We talked about, we opened our eyes to why does the church exist? Because these are the things that we're going to talk about today. What is the main message? What is the main goal? What is the main purpose that we, a community of people, gather together? Because the way you answer those questions is going to profoundly affect the kind of community that we share. Now here, I put the wrong verse, verse number, so that's my bad. But here, Paul is uh, wrapping up a parenthetical remark. He, he has just told the Corinthians, I want there not to be any divisions among you. And a bunch of people were rallying about behind different pastors' names. So he says, some of you guys are saying, I follow Apollos, because Paulus was a pastor uh, in that day. And a lot of people thought that if they rally behind the pastor, then, then that's how they show that they're super Christians and the others are just bad Christians. And so Paul goes so far as to say, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you, because then nobody would have the right to say, I was baptized by Paul, and therefore my baptism is way better than your baptism. But he finishes off that remark um, by saying, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you to create divisions, by saying, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but look, to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. That second half of that verse, we're going to talk about a lot more toward the end of this study, so I'm going to try to move along quickly. But Paul says he was sent to preach the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is paramount to Paul. It is really, really, really important. The gospel is the most important news that we can share. Every one of us understands the law. We understand to some degree that we are sinners and that we have failed. Our consciences uh, convict us sometimes when we do what's wrong. Scripture also teaches that we have what's called the natural knowledge of God's law. We know what God expects of us, and we know that we're held accountable to something. You don't have to read the Bible to know that, you're, uh, that, that you should live a good life, that you shouldn't do things like uh, steal or murder or cheat on your wife or things like that. And then we also have God's written law. What God says in his scripture, he describes, he opens up our eyes to see exactly what he expects of us. There's a little bit that we understand by our nature naturally and by conscience, but when we read scripture, we see, oh man, it's much bigger than that. God has all these other expectations. Living a holy life is much more complicated than I realized and I'm much less able to do it than I, than I thought I was able to. And this is an important realization to make. I gotta, gotta keep moving my face here. But it's that gospel that's the most important. We have to hear that our salvation comes from Christ, the cross of Christ, which is powerful, which is amazing, which is the most important thing, so that sin-sick sinners, people who feel guilty over their sin, can know that they, that they are saved by a loving God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. Paul says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the problem. When you meet a lot of people and when you ask them the question, why should you get into heaven? What makes sense to most people is that the way to get into heaven is to live a good life, is to do things that God, uh, do the things that God expects of you. And that would be true if we could. If we could live a 100% perfect life, we could get ourselves into heaven. The problem is none of us can't. 
Only Jesus has ever lived a 100% perfect life. And so when you tell somebody that the, the natural reaction to somebody who is opposed to the gospel, the natural reaction to somebody who's stubborn and set in their ways and they're not going to believe in this Jesus stuff is to say that's all a bunch of foolishness because you have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself to say, I can't do it on my own. I need an outside source. I need an outside savior. And for some people, people who are perishing, unfortunately, that's just too much to say. But to us who are being saved, the message of the cross, the powerful gospel, that good news of, of Christ crucified for sinners like you and me, that's the power of God. You and I have not been converted to the Christian faith because we were so smart and we heard it and it was such a good idea. Uh, and so we decided to start believing. No, it is God's power that brings us into the faith. Uh, Paul says later on in, in Corinthians, I'm trying to minimize it. There we go. Paul says later on in Corinthians that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Right, Catechism kids? That faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. And that, that's passage from Romans. But the way that people come to faith is by the powerful word, the powerful word of God, and by baptism, which is also is a means of grace through which God communicates his gospel to a sinful heart. So this is not an intellectual game. So, but I want to ask, are wisdom and eloquence opposed to the gospel? I'll, I'll explain what I mean about that, and then I encourage you to pause and discuss with those around you. So since the power of God, is, the gospel is the power of God, and um, no one is converted by, by uh, shall we say, clever arguments or clever presentations, but it's the Holy Spirit who works through the message that creates faith in, in him alone, God's great grace through faith alone, through the scriptures. Does that mean that I have free reign to just, uh, I as pastor, to not, not prepare sermons, to just walk up? in front of sir in front of the service and just read out of the bible and say well that's the power of god and then i sit down and i say amen not exactly but what we're talking about is the difference between the what and the how the what and i encourage you to pay attention to this because i'm going to refer back to it later in this study is the gospel the content of the message that we share here at church or in a group of Christians, no, any true Christians, the content of the message is law gospel. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you need that salvation, but it's provided freely for you through faith in Christ. That's the what, and that's the most important thing. The how is also important, but it's not as important. So taking it back to me as pastor, I need to prepare a sermon well. I need to prepare to um, explain the word well. I need to do my best on the how so that the what is not obstructed. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? So we prepare a, a witness. We, we want to present the truth about Christ so that it can be understood. And so the, the how is important because we want to be clear. We want to we want to share the power of Christ. We, but the what, the, the message of the gospel is always more important. Um, more on that in a, in a couple of minutes. Once again, as you get to those questions, I'd encourage you to pause and, and discuss with the group around you or with, if you're texting somebody or if you're talking to somebody, go ahead and, and chat it over real quick. And I'd be happy to hear your, your answers. I'd be excited to hear that. Moving on and jumping to 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 25, he says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. So Paul is kind of drawing a line in the sand. There were these ethnic groups in the time of the church of Corinth. And of course, there were Jews who considered that Christ on the cross was, fool, was, uh, was a stumbling block. What, how? What better way to um, demonstrate weakness than to allow yourself to be killed and executed? Uh, unbelieving Jews thought that it was foolish, that it was weak. Uh, no one, that couldn't be the Messiah. That could not be the Christ they set up on that cross because that's defeat. That's, that's weakness. 
And then the, the Gentiles, and remember Gentiles is, is just a word for, for non-Jews, it was foolishness. As you might recall, the Gentiles, the, the Greeks and the Romans of this time were very obsessed with rhetoric. They were obsessed with public speaking. And if, if you were a good uh, orator, if you were a good person who could unravel an argument and give a good speech, that was, that was awesome. But to them, they found the, the simple message of law, gospel, Christ crucified on a cross to save us from our sins. They thought, mm, that, that sounds kind of dumb. That sounds kind of foolish. How can I, why should I put my trust in that for my salvation when I'm an intellectual, when I'm a wise guy, when I uh, listen to all these speech givers and, and things like that? But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is kind of an ironic situation. It's kind of, kind of the irony that something so simple and so foolish in front of other people actually is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And those two ethnic groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, they're in the same boat, though, because Jew and Gentile alike are sinners, just like you and me, just like all, all human beings. We are all sinners, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of barriers, regardless of background, regardless of history, whether you're a, a, you've served multiple sentences for your crimes or whether you are a very important person, a politician, and you've never gone to jail or you've never gotten caught, all of us is a sinner deserving of death, deserving of hell. That's true about all of us. Now, that's the law. That's what the law has to say to us. The gospel, of course, says that Christ is your salvation. Um, you, you, sinner though you are, are saved by the sacrifice of Christ. And this is the most important thing that you could ever hear. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Paul says that this is intentional, that God chooses the weak things to shame the strong, as Paul says in, a, in another place. Paul, uh, God chooses the foolish things to shame the wise. God has demonstrated his power through weakness, through his son on the cross shedding his blood and dying. It's ironic, but it's the most important message you and I could ever hear, because that's the message of our salvation from sin. I'd like you to pause now and discuss with your group how does the gospel break down barriers? How does the, those themes and that message that we just discussed, how does it unite people, even different people? And if you have a story about how you've seen that happen or how that's worked for you or something you've even heard from someone else, how do you have a story about watching the gospel break down barriers? Moving on to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, Paul says, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. You're watching Paul strike a difference between human wisdom and God's wisdom. He's striking a difference between what things humans might call attractive or, or fun to listen to or fun to be around and what God calls important and wise. He says that Jesus has become wisdom for us, and he explains that, that uh, remark by saying that Christ has become our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Isn't that interesting, the way that Paul says it? He doesn't just say that Christ has achieved for us righteousness, holiness, or redemption, but he has become for us righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Now let's real quick talk about the difference between those three terms. Righteousness, you can think of it as rightness or innocence. Righteousness between you and God means a good relationship, it means that nothing, there's no grudges, there's no um, record of wrongs, you might say. That when God looks at you, he's not angry because of the sins that you've done, but he sees an innocent person. And how could any one of us expect to be righteous in God's sight? 
when we have done so much wrong, when we have sinned so constantly throughout our lives? Well, it's because of Christ. It's because Christ took our sins to the cross and gave us his righteousness as a gift. That's how Christ has become our righteousness. Through the work of Christ and through what he has done for us, we also are called holy. We are made holy through faith. Uh, we might use the word sanctification for the way that you and I have become holy. And sanctification is something that you and I grow in. We grow in our ability to practice and live out that holiness that we've been granted through faith, uh, through faith in Christ, worked by the Holy Spirit. Because we are called to live, now that we believe in Christ, now that we understand our righteousness and redemption through Christ, we are called to live a different kind of life. We don't want to go back into the sins that we committed before and that we have been forgiven from. Um, so we choose, we choose to serve and honor and give thanks to God, knowing that it's a struggle, knowing that it, it will be a struggle until we're in heaven and when we're free from, from our sinful nature. But that's our sanctification. We grow in that ability. We, we win more battles um, when our faith is fed by the Holy Spirit through the word, through the gospel, and the means of grace. Christ has also become our redemption. Redeeming, remember, means buying back. Christ has purchased us with his blood. His blood was like the money that bought, bought our lives so that we could be free, free from slavery to sin, free and free to service in God's kingdom. That's all the things that Christ has won for us. You see, the, you see the connection of freedom between all of this. You're free from your sin. And although you struggle with your sinful nature day by day, God is with you. God has given you Christ, who is your righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Stick with him. Run to Christ because he, that, that's your gospel. That's, uh, that's, what, that's what we hang on to. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5 that my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Then he says, so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Are you still seeing the difference between human wisdom and God's wisdom or human wisdom? And now he says God's power. What's the danger of getting too focused on the how? Remember, the what is the content of what we share, the, the gospel, the good news of, of Christ crucified for sinners like you and me. That's the what, and the how is how we choose to present that, how, uh, how we present it in sermons, how we do it in our, our worship services, or how you, how you share it in your personal witness. But what's the danger of getting too focused on the how? Moving on, we're going to shoot over to a different epistle from the Apostle Paul, his second letter to Timothy. Paul says to Timothy, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. So if you read it back, if you reflect it back, he says, this is my gospel. Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. These are the most important things that Paul marks out for Timothy to understand that Jesus is Christ, that he, he's the Messiah. He was raised from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that empty tomb is central, is so important to the gospel, to the message, to the what that we share in, in church. If you take away the resurrection from the dead, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what do you have left? You don't have much of a gospel left. Uh, but he is also descended from David, that Jesus, according to his earthly earthly ancestry came from David. And his connection to the descendants from, from David means, reminds us, that this has been God's plan from the beginning, from human ancestry on, and all these promises that God gave to David, and since David, and before David, about how this earthly line would produce a savior for all of, human, uh, all of the human race from their sin, forever who, forever who would no, for whomever would believe in him. Said, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. At the time that Paul wrote 2 Timothy, it's likely that he knew that he was going to die. So 2 Timothy was kind of his last will and testament, you'll hear people say. 
So he, he's letting, letting Timothy know from prison, from his chains, that I, this is my gospel. So what was Paul willing to do? Evidently, how important was the what, the gospel, the content of what we share and, and the message that we preach to Paul? So important that he blank. How would you fill in the blank? Moving on to Hebrews 10, verses 23 to 25, looking at a concrete how, looking at a how. The writer to the Hebrews, remember we don't, we're not positive who the writer to the Hebrews was, says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. That he, of course, being uh, Christ, being God. What is the hope that you profess? The hope that you and I profess is that we're saved from our sins and that we don't go to hell when we die, but we go up to heaven. Let's hold on to that hope in the right here and the right now. It's something that you're going to see happen in the future when you die and go to heaven. You're going to finally see it happen, but it, it, it helps you make it through the day here and now with the sufferings that you have to go through, with the struggles against temptation that you have to undergo. You know that you're saved, that Christ is on your side, that Christ is your Savior. And that one day he'll deliver you into God's, God's kingdom. He continues, he says, let us consider how, aha, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approaching. Let me ask you. What does the author to the Hebrews encourages, encourage us to brainstorm? Read back verse 24. And he, once you've answered that question, he even points to a very clear way that we do this, that we spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And can you tell what that is in verse 25? So by way of wrapping it up, I, once again, have something for you to think about, something for you to talk about, and something for you to pray about. So look at your group, get your group back together if you've wandered off, <laughs> or if you're by yourself, that's perfectly fine as well. But think about this. Think about the importance of hearing both law and gospel for yourself. And then ponder the importance of sharing both law and gospel with others. Why do you want to share both the doctrine of law and the doctrine of gospel? Ready for something to talk about? Talk about your experiences of sharing the what of your faith. Remember, the what is the content. The what is the gospel. The what is the fact that Jesus Christ has died for you and me, for sinners. Surely all of you, no matter, no matter who you are, have some experience of opening up about what you believe, of opening up about that gospel that you hold so dear. Talk about your experiences. What happened? Um, how did people react? How did you choose to do it? How did you try? How did you try it out? Where have you seen deficiencies? What, what could you use help with about sharing the what of your faith? How can we as a church prepare and train you and help you to do that better? and to, to help other people learn, other sinners learn about their salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Finally, something to pray about. In your group or by yourself or with somebody, take turns asking God to give strength and encouragement to and through your Christian community. Who is your Christian community? Well, if you're a member of the family of Trinity Lutheran Church, pray about Trinity. Ask God to give us strength and encouragement so that we can continue on doing what God would have us do with his gospel. And ask God to give you encouragement and strength through your community. Ask God to bless our work as your, as your Christian community, as your church family. Take turns saying it in your own way, asking God for specific things, for specific ways that we could do that as a church. To finish up, I'd like to go all the way back to our beginning of the lesson, 
And I'd like to go back to this question. Why does our church exist? Now, how would you answer that question? How would I answer that question? <laughs> our church exists to be a community, to be a community gathered around the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, and to bring others into that community, to, to bridge barriers, to break down barriers so that other people can know that they are saved by the blood of Christ. That's why we exist, to encourage one another, to spur one another on, as the author to the Hebrew says, but also to reach the lost souls who don't know about Christ yet with that wonderful gospel so that they can join us in heaven someday as well. Thank you for joining us for our second lesson. I hope I didn't get cut off this time because I know that happened last time. If you have comments and questions of any kind, feel free to leave a comment on Facebook or on YouTube or shoot us a message or contact us in some way. We would love to hear your feedback uh, and connect with you about this study. God bless you and keep you. And until next time.